Hey everybody, and welcome back to International Health. I'm recording this video about the digital divide because I had to go and uh, leave town for undisclosed reasons. Uh, nothing too exciting, I assure you, but I'm trying to be mysterious. I came for mysterious reasons, and now I'm in some undisclosed location, which may or may not be my parents' house in Toronto. I neither confirm nor deny anything. But instead of a live lecture with me, my friends, you get this recorded video once more. And today we are talking about the digital divide. Now in this course, we've covered the, uh, the traditional aspects of global health. Things like, you know, the big diseases, the malarias, the tuberculosis, the HIVs. We talked about epidemiology. We talked about the World Bank. And that stuff you can find pretty much in, in any global health textbook going back 20, 30 years. Um, it's the new things that are interesting. And I kind of struggle about which new things or emerging concerns or, or cutting edge issues to make a, a core portion of, of this course. Um, clearly climate change had to be included, so we had a, a big lecture on climate change. Uh, hunger had to be included. Um, maybe uh, uh, sex selection is something I should have included but I won't be including but definitely I thought something about computers has to be talked about um, because this is a backbone of the global economy now information technology and who accesses information technology determines who accesses power and wealth and global health and development is ultimately about power and wealth the disparities that we are analyzing and studying are disparities of self-determination and power. And that's often gated by economic power. And these days, economic power is gated by information technology. So, what is the digital divide? Well, we have to first think about rights. Is access to information a right? We've been arguing in this program for a long time about whether or not access to health is a right. And why is that even relevant? Because once you say something's a right, then governments are morally, if not almost legally, compelled to give it to you. So life is a right. Is happiness a right? Possibly. Is health a right? Possibly. Is education a right? I think most people agree that it is. But the right to information? What does that even mean? Could it be the right to the internet? Now, there was uh, a landmark court case in the U.S. a few years ago in which a sex offender, a registered sex offender, who was denied access to Facebook because Facebook had a policy of not allowing sex offenders on their platform, he uh, sued Facebook for the right to have access to that experience. And he was defended by the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, and he won. The argument was that these days, social media, in particular Facebook, is such a critical part of the lived human experience that to deny someone that experience, or at least the option of that experience, is cruel and unusual. So maybe the right to information isn't just the right to newspapers and, and the news and, and finding out what's happening in the world. It's also a right to the social integrative experience of social media. Uh, the business-making experience of the World Wide Web, the communication experience of email, all that wonderful stuff that you and I take for granted. So, freedom of expression is a right, according to most uh, democratic nations. So maybe part of freedom of expression is the right to the Internet. Right. Who's this lovely woman? This is Ada Lovelace. And I like talking about Ada Lovelace, um, especially for uh, the women in the class, because it's important that we all recognize groundbreaking women in STEM. STEM, of course, is science, technology, uh, engineering, and the M is either medicine or mathematics. I always forget which one it is. But Ada Lovelace was the daughter of Lord Byron, um, a famous poet, which should not be her claim to fame, but it is. But her other claim to fame is that she was also possibly, probably, the world's first computer programmer. She was a mathematician, and she wrote a series of algorithms, uh, instructions, for 
um, for how a particular computing device would function. That computing device was the Babbage engine. The Babbage engine didn't exist. It was a theoretical construct put forth by Charles Babbage that would have been the world's first computer if they only knew how to build it. Uh, centuries later, well, centuries, I suppose, two centuries later, uh, engineers actually did build the Babbage engine and showed that it would have worked if they could have built it back in the Victorian age. Um, but Ada Lovelace wrote the instructions for the Babbage engine, and that is considered to be the very first computer program in human history. So every year, uh, computer nerds like myself celebrate Ada Lovelace Day. And in 2017, this year, it was October 10. Last year, it was October 11. So it's always sometime in October. So uh, think about Ada Lovelace the next time you think about the role of women in information technology. So what is the digital divide? It is the gap between those who have digital stuff and those who don't have digital stuff. So, one of the biggest global health challenges is access to information. Earlier this week, uh, our guest lecturer, Dr. Ziad Khatib, talked about how uh, SMS on cell phones is now revolutionizing access to a variety of services, both health and financial, in Rwanda. Well, imagine if you could use the internet to get a better price for your products. You didn't have to show up in person to negotiate with various marketplaces. How much easier your life would be. That's a particular example that I chose because it's a real example. If we think about fishermen in South India, for centuries they would go out and catch fish and they come back to shore and then they take their fish to the various markets on the beach to see which one gives them a good price and they'd waste hours doing so. Now they can get on their cell phones and a few years ago, they would call around to their partners on the beach and ask, hey, I've got some fish. Who's got the best price for the fish that I have? And now they actually get on their smartphones and look up on the websites of the various markets on the shore. And so by the time they get back to the shore, they already know exactly who to go to to deliver their goods. The technology of, sh of fishing hasn't changed. The ships haven't changed. The, um, the types of people engaging in this work hasn't changed. But this one little tool this connected cell phone is revolutionizing how they access product and remuneration and therefore how much power they have in their lives. So let's not take for granted access to information especially via the Internet. It's been long argued that the most fundamental resource in our lives is knowledge. And in fact, the modern economy is a knowledge economy. I've long stated in this course that we have in the evolution of societies this growth from an agrarian economy to a manufacturing economy to a services economy. And as we progress along that spectrum, we become wealthier. The wealthiest nations in this world are information economies. Information economies also allow for the demographic transition, smaller populations, lesser stresses on our, on our ecology, and so forth. So transitioning to a knowledge-based economy means access to knowledge. That also means that's how we transition to modernness. The, in, the Internet allows us to do so. Here's a quote from Nelson Mandela. Now, you all know who Nelson Mandela is, right? He says, in the 21st century, the capacity to communicate will almost certainly be a key human right. Eliminating the distinction between the information rich, that's us, and the information poor, that's a lot of people in poor countries, is also critical to eliminating economic and other inequalities between North and South. Remember, North means wealthy countries, South means poor countries, and to improve the life of all humanity. He said this back in 1995, 22 years ago. So even back then, we knew access to the Internet would be a defining characteristic of the struggles for power parity in the world. Back then, we did not foresee exactly what the Internet would look like. We had websites and email back then. We didn't have uh, the high security uh, transmissions we have now. We haven't got banking at the current levels we have now. Uh, we haven't got robotics or uh, cryptocurrency that we have today, but all that stuff is part of the conversation. So the global di digital divide refers to 
the disparities in opportunity to accessing the internet. There's a primary divide and a secondary divide, and I'll go into what that means in a second. But right now we're talking about the primary divide. The primary divide is accessing the internet. Who gets to access it versus who doesn't get to access it. If you can access it, think about what you have access to. You have access, of course, to Facebook and email and all the great ways of, of forming communities and to organize and also to keep your mental health strong. Also to damage your mental health. We all know that you know Facebook can be pretty horrible for that as well. But also you have opportunities for self-education and for distance education and for immediate feeding of your knowledge and for understanding what's happening in the world via instantaneous news. You also have access to easier business. Do you watch Shark Tank or Dragon's Den? Look at what all those startups um, begin their, their spiel with. They always start by saying, we have this product. Currently we're selling it online. We haven't got you know a storefront yet. And that's because in the new economy it is much easier to bring your products to market via web marketing and web sales than it is via bricks and mortar retail stores that cost a lot more money. So if you have to rely on physical sales you are at a profound disadvantage in the modern economy. So if you're in a nation that is not well wired suddenly you have an old-fashioned uh, system by which you have to get your business up and running. It's a huge disadvantage in the world. Here's some stats. So back in 2002, 88% of all internet users were from rich countries. And yet those people comprise only 15% of the world's population. Now things have changed since then. And I want you to think about how they have changed. And I'll give you some stats in a second. But as recently as 10 years ago, almost all of the internet use was in rich countries. And that was an extreme minority of the human population. This graph is kind of interesting. So here we see um, the world. So w the world use of the internet has been going up steadily. And this red curve shows us use of the internet in poor countries, in developing countries. right? So it's, it's tracked the world growth quite closely. But this shows us rich countries. It's gone crazy. It's exploding. And this distance here, that's the digital divide. That's the gap that we're talking about. We would like to see the entire world reach that level of usage and access. So back here, our data ends in 2007. Right? So we don't know what happens after that. But do we? We do have some data since 2007. So we know that in the past 10 years, um, global internet use has gone up from t about 20% of the world to half the world. Rapidly, the world is becoming wired. When I first started giving global health lectures, I was really fond of, of shocking the audience with a particular statistic. I always said, do you know that half the world has yet to make a phone call? I was saying that 15 years ago. It was true 15 years ago. I don't know that it's true today. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's not true today. Well, maybe it is true in the sense that no one actually makes phone calls anymore. But pretty much the majority of the human race has a phone or access to a cell phone. Yes, uh, calls are being um, uh, made, but also texting is being done. A lot of global health work now is uh, being done on, on, on how SMS, text messaging, can be used to accelerate or assist in the delivery of global health programs. Uh, Dr. Khatib earlier this week talked about one of them. Um, I've seen a variety of other ones where um, in an HIV program, for example, all patients registered in an HIV program in Sub-Saharan Africa would simply get occasionally an SMS reminding them to take their drugs or ask them, how are you doing this week, right, by a healthcare provider. And that little bit of, of, of encouragement, reinforcement, seems to show great dividends in their uh, treatment progress. And that's just one example. Uh, we're seeing all sorts of creative uses of cell phone technologies in the field. If you go to the Grand Challenges website, what's the Grand Challenges? The Grand Challenges is a funding stream in Canada, grandchallenges.ca, where um, academics uh, compete for small grants to show innovative uses of communication technology in global health. If you go to that website, you'll see a host of funded projects, most of which use uh, cell phones, 
to do all kinds of interesting global health work. Uh, I had pitched a few projects in the past. I never got funded. If you want to hear what mine are, I, I probably shouldn't talk about them in a recording like this that the world can see. But we pitched a number of ideas, including using SMS to encourage male um, uh, commitment to family health in parts of the Caribbean. We pitched a project to create a parallel Twitter feed strictly for healthcare providers in low-income countries to connect them with high-income users. It's more complicated than that, but you get the idea. There, there are creative ways to use these technologies to invest in and ameliorate health strategies. So back to the digital divide because the divide still exists even though I just said a lot of the world has phones now a lot of the world doesn't have reliable access to high-speed internet so some of the things that manifest in the divide are infrastructure what does that mean it means some places in the world don't have reliable access we're lucky you and I have um, Wi-Fi pretty reliable Wi-Fi pretty much everywhere we go in our own homes there's Wi-Fi uh, there's broadband all over the place. There's hardwired cables giving you know, T1, uh, T1 cables with high speed access. Many parts of the world rely upon line of sight connections. What does that mean? It means that maybe one facility, usually a corner store, might have internet access and they can beam it, the line of sight, to another building several hundred meters away and that's in a really good case scenario. There is some talk of setting up uh, balloons, helium balloons, that could broadcast internet. Um, Richard Branson, Elon Musk, Bill Gates have all talked about creating a satellite network around the world to actually create a, uh, a space-based internet network for the world to use. Digital literacy. This is the idea of, of uh, it's one thing to have access can you actually use it? What kind of educational barriers are in place that prevent people from using the technology to its fullest? Location of access. Again, you and I have internet in our homes. That's crazy. We have it in our pockets, in our phones, high speed. We have it everywhere. For a lot of people, they have to go to a particular place to log in to check their email. And not just in poor countries, in rich countries as well. Have you been to a public library recently? I encourage you to do so. Public libraries are very important. But in many major cities in North America, the public libraries are used primarily by poor people who don't have computers to go and check their email. And the applications. So, uh, do poor p countries and poor people have access to the same functionality of the internet? You and I, we can do our banking via our phones. We can transfer money via our phones. We can access our course materials via our phones and our laptops. Not everyone has that capacity. Some places all they have really is just email. Social media is another big one. You're probably aware that some countries actively block access to Facebook and create their own versions. That prevents uh, organization. It prevents cross-border communication. So let's uh, talk a bit about gender. Um, a few demographics have effects that percolate through every issue that we examine and gender is one such demographic. So it's an interesting statistic. After we control for things like employment, education, and income, women at a global level tend to be more active digital users than men. That might surprise you surprises me and I'm not sure how they got that information you can read about it there but I, I suspect that you know that that may be skewed a bit by social media usage um, may not be entirely programmatic usage I'm not entirely sure but at the same time we could ask ourselves are women excluded from this, the, the higher income aspects of the digital experience um, are they likely to get tech education are they likely to be well employed in the tech sector um, it's unclear. So, the global internet user gender gap has been growing, interestingly, from 11% to 12% in that three-year period on the slide. What does that mean? It means the gap between male usage and female usage has been growing. 
and it's large in the poorest countries. So there is this relationship between national wealth and the gap, the size of the gender gap. Clearly in the Americas we have the smallest gap because men and women in, in North and South America tend to use the internet in the same rates, but in Sub-Saharan Africa they do not. You can read this uh, article here about how uh, some people think that India's digital divide is making the gender gap even worse because it's the men there who are using it more than the women and the men therefore are getting better educated than the women, getting better uh, access to information, maybe even getting better job opportunities. Um, there is some intersectionality between gender, income, and the urban-rural divide. So in rural areas, the gender gap is high in high-income countries but low in low-income countries. But in urban areas, it's high in low-income countries and low in high-income countries. What can we take away from that? Not a whole lot. Uh, the lesson there is just that there are different stories to be told in different parts of the world. So there isn't just one theme, one narrative emerging at a global level. There's some regional variation. And of course age is also a factor. We all know that uh, older people tend to be less computer literate. Even though I'm going to push back on that for a bit. I'm extremely computer literate and in the years that I've been teaching uh, every cohort of students that comes in I find are less computer savvy than the previous cohort. So there's something going on with young people that maybe they, they tend to be using computers more but less able to get into the, the, the skeleton and the guts of the computers. Programming coding, I guess you would call it now, is not the virtue it once was in my youth. So this is not as uh, straightforward as it may appear. So the relationship between age and gender is a real thing uh, when we talk about the, the uh, digital gap. So uh, what is the data here say? It says that the digital gender gap increases as age increases. Not surprising. So the older we are, the more likely that one gender uses information technology more than the other. And that is also gated by high income versus low income countries. So in high income countries like Canada, uh, amongst the elderly, women are more likely than men to be digital users. In low income countries, amongst the elderly, men are more likely than women to be users. And that's of course confounded by literacy in general. In uh, low-income countries, older women are less likely to be as literate as older men. Okay, so, so far we've been talking about this thing called the primary digital divide. The primary digital divide is who gets access to the internet, more or less. The secondary digital divide is who makes stuff for the internet. Because up until recently, it doesn't matter where you were in the world, if you're accessing content online, you're accessing content that was produced by Western countries. All the edu education, the entertainment, the social media sites, all that stuff was made by Western countries. Not so much anymore. So the secondary digital divide is between who makes the content, the rich countries versus the poor countries. And the emerging economies are making more and more of their own content now. That's why we have, if you ever look at the uh, trending topics on Twitter at the global level, uh, very often they're not in any language that I could recognize. That's a good thing. It means that the rest of the world has a voice at least as loud as the English-speaking world. So, the, the primary digital divide is a computer, is a consumer gap. So who is consuming content? And the secondary digital gap is a production gap. Who is producing content? So how do we close the gap and why can't we close the gap as quickly as maybe we'd like? First is we have to be able to have um, physical access to the internet. We have to spend money to get people computers. Second is maybe people don't have money to pay for their access. Third is there are uh, demographic barriers. We mentioned the, uh, the rural urban gap, the gender gap, the age gap. Cognitive access, are people um, aware of the need to have this access? Design access, what does that mean? That means that maybe 
the machines are made appropriately for some populations. Think about the QWERTY layout. Is that relevant for an Arabic-speaking population or a Chinese population where they don't use the Roman alphabet? Institutional access. So in some parts of the world you can only get good quality internet from universities. That's a big one. That's a big one. And so you can only get uh, an email address if you're part of a university and only the elite are part of institutions or universities uh, or government. Right? So political access is another one. I mentioned uh, some countries limit access to certain applications like social media for political purposes and cultural access. Uh, I don't know what I meant by cultural access, but I'm sure it'll come to me later when I've had some sleep. How is this relevant to health? I think it's fairly obvious, but I'll spell it out anyway. Uh, EBM is evidence-based medicine. Uh, many years ago, I gave a talk in uh, a particularly poor country in South America, and this lecture was given to private physicians. And I was selling the virtues of EBM, of evidence-based medicine. And as you know, evidence-based medicine is the process of, of formulating a good clinical question, going to the literature, and uh, assessing the quality of the evidence in the literature, and then refining an answer for that clinical question. And the pushback I got was, that's great. We would love to be able to do this. However, we can't get access to the papers that you need to refine your answer to the research question. We can't do a systematic review. We can't even do a basic literature review. We can't go to PubMed and look up abstracts. Why? Two reasons. First is that let's say you could actually look up uh, ac um, uh, papers using the old card catalog system. They can't afford the papers. And if they could afford them, it'll take days for the papers to arrive to that country. Now, of course, you probably don't realize this, but now um, we have uh, almost everything is online, but back in the day, it, they, they weren't. You, had, you rely on physical papers. Um, and the second reason they said uh, this is not possible for us is if we don't have computers with good internet access, we can't do the searches of the digital papers. So, um, if we want physicians in low-income countries to make informed, evidence-based decisions, we need to empower them with access to information that means the internet. CME means continuing medical education. So uh, when a physician graduates from medical school, that's not the entirety of knowledge they are required to have for a full lifetime's worth of productive service to their population. They're supposed to learn throughout their lives. And we call the formal aspects of this learning CME, or continuing medical education. It's, it's a formal process. Uh, in Canada, uh, a doctor would get CME credits for, every, for attending specialized lectures that have been um, pre-selected for those purposes. And I've given CME lectures myself for doctors. And sometimes those CME opportunities are online. Because otherwise you have to wait for a visiting scholar to come to your country and give a talk. As I did in this particular case in South America, the doctors attending got CME credits for, for my presentation. Um, if you have to wait months for a visiting scholar to arrive, you're going to advance poorly in your career and your population will be poorly served. So the internet often offers an opportunity for more rapid receipt of medical education for existing health professionals. So, um, an obvious way in which the internet can be used to improve health is via distance health. So, e-health tools. Um, that comes in a variety of formats. Uh, I've seen kiosks being pitched um, that you stick your hand in and it, it measures your blood pressure and your pulse, and then a screen pops up and you talk to a nurse. And this is all done in the remote Arctic, and the nurse is somewhere in Toronto. And so these tools are possible now for you know uh, direct health care of individuals who otherwise would have to travel for hundreds of miles to see a doctor. Uh, you can Skype with your doctor in some places now as well, or have uh, your test results sent to you uh, remotely. Information technology is essential for a health information system, HIS. What is an HIS? An HIS is typically national, but it can be regional as well. It's a national wired system wherein we track patients 
and their medical conditions. So I've been involved in making HISs for, uh, well, consulting on the making of HISs for some countries. And there's a, it's a, it's a, a marriage between information technology and epidemiology. And HISs are important for a number of reasons. One is that they reduce wastage or abuse of a system. Think about it. in Canada, here in Ottawa, you can, in one day, if you've got the sniffles, see your family doctor, uh, go to walk-in clinic, and go to the ER for the same complaint, and, and bill the system three times. And probably we'll never find out about that because we have a not a very good tracking system, in my opinion. A good HIS would locate that, would, would identify that right away, and prevent you from seeing a second provider after you've seen the first one for the same condition. Second, uh, an HIS allows us to detect epidemics. So, um, suddenly we see a cluster of people uh, reporting uh, similar conditions in that region over there. We can probably assume there's something, some kind of outbreak going on we should investigate. And third, it allows us to move resources accordingly in the event of a shortage or, uh, or migration and so forth. Another, uh, another reason, a fourth reason, would be there is contiguity of patient care. So if you can take your personal ID number and you're, and you're moving throughout the country, um, suddenly I could be diagnosed in this region, I go to that region there, and uh, the pharmacy knows uh, to give me the drug that I was diagnosed with before. My medical records travel with me. So HISs breed efficiency and epidemiological power. So, some people argue that maybe the digital divide is not that important. And they would say so because maybe it's not real. Maybe this, this difference between the haves and have-nots is not a real thing. It's just a perceived issue. It doesn't really affect our lives. That's a kind of weak argument. Of course it's real. Second, they say that technologies are transient. Think about it. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, we were talking about the, the divide between people who had access to typewriters and those who didn't. Who cares about typewriters now? Nobody. Right? So maybe if we just wait long enough, uh, the valuation of computers and the internet will be something of the past anyway. Third, people argue that, well, the system is getting smarter. So if the system is getting smarter, then the barrier to their use is getting smaller. So this won't be that big of a problem. Already in my home, I've got a Google Assistant. I walk in and I, I tell Google, Google, turn on the TV and, and play me this show and um, sing me a song and add the following to my calendar. And I lay in my couch and this is all done via my voice. It's pretty cool, right? Well, we'll, we'll all have that in a, in a few years. Um, a couple of years ago, I would have had to open up my computer, create linkages with the TV, uh, open up my calendar and do things that require me to understand the process. Now by virtue of my voice alone, I don't need to even know how to open up my computer to do all that. So bit by bit, the system gets easier to use and so the barrier for entry gets smaller. If I were talking to you in person, as I typically would in this class, I would bring to you my XO laptop, and I'm kind of sad that I'm not able to show it to you in person. So instead, you get this picture. This is what the XO laptop looks like. And every year, I pass around my XO laptop, and and people poke at it. And they go, what was this thing? What kind, of, what kind of toy is this? There was a time when the XO laptop was fairly impressive, not so much anymore. But look at it. See, that's what it looks like. It's a cool thing. What is it? It is an experiment. It was a brainchild of Nicholas Negroponte, who was an MIT professor. And his, his idea was, um, well, if you want to make sure the digital divide is breached, or removed or filled, whatever the right verb is, then we need to get a computer into every home. But, but how do we train people to use computers? Well, his, uh, his insight was, maybe we don't need to. Maybe if we make um, a durable, inexpensive, fairly simple computer and give it to every child in the world, the natural playfulness of children will allow them to figure it out themselves. That was the major assumption.
And the vision was that he would just give one to every child. And it would be literally the source of light in many of these low-tech homes. So his process was that he brought together a consortium of the top IT people in the world, people from uh, Intel and I think uh, Yahoo and places like that, um, to get together to talk about how we can do this. And they were able to create a really inexpensive, powerful computer. That was the Exo laptop. That maybe I'll bring it to you later in, in the school year if I remember. So um, it's under 200 bucks. All the stuff is open source. Open source means there's no fees associated with things like uh, Linux operating system. Right? That makes it um, that makes it cheaper, and it's almost indestructible. It's plastic. It's sand resistant. It's a bit water resistant. You can use it outside because most you know poor kids are outside all the time. There's no glare. Uh, the battery lasts a very long time. If you're in an area where there is no power, it's got a crank associated with it. It has a really powerful um, Wi-Fi. Uh, antenna so we can get to distance signals and the plan was of course to produce you know Wi-Fi um, uh, mesh broadcasters in every village fascinating in fact the, the computer was so good that a lot of the people in the consortium went back to their companies and started making knockoffs this is why we had the netbook revolution of about uh, five eight years ago do you remember netbooks Maybe someone in class actually has a netbook. A netbook is a cheap laptop that's solid state. It has no moving parts, no worrying drives. A lot of my students had netbooks five years ago. It seemed to have gone out of fashion. But the netbook was the result of the Exo laptop. So the Exo laptop was not adopted as widely as Negroponte had hoped. I think India and Brazil started uh, um, experiments in. in having it sent out to a variety of places. Um, the model was that if I, as a, a wealthy person from, from the West, wanted to buy one for myself, I would have to also donate one to the developing world, which I did. All right? And I could afford it, I mean, 200 bucks, that's really cheap for a computer, especially back in, in the day, which was um, when computers were several thousand dollars. So the XO laptop, as I said, was almost indestructible. Uh, this open source operating system, Linux based, made sure it was uh, inexpensive, uh, designed for outdoor use, no moving parts. Now today that's fairly typical for laptops. If you've got a, a Mac Airbook, I believe those are solid state. My computer that I'm filming this on right now, that my Dell XPS, that's solid state. Uh, great Wi-Fi. And a child-friendly interface. What does that mean? It means that the operating system they created was uh, um, proprietary for the EXO laptop. It's childish. It's got some games you can play. It's got a music thing. It has a, a chat function to talk to your friends, a word processor, but very easy to use for children because that's the target market. The controversies though. Is it reasonable that this is a way to bring an entire family into the modern techno world via a child. Second, this, this the, the operating system, this childlike operating system, it's not really that useful. It does not translate well into a marketable skill in the real world. Um, they kind of figured this out years later and created a version that could run Windows XP because Windows XP is well known already and can translate well into the world. And can it make can it achieve that level of, of acceptance and penetration such that it makes it actually uh, financially viable to produce? The answer was no, right? because new competitors entered that market. All the people around that table, especially Intel, went back to their, their, uh, their companies and started making similar products. So the XO laptop, most people I think would agree, was a failure. So, recently they rolled out the Exo tablet. Same idea. The tablet is meant to allow children in low-income countries to enter the digital era easily using these very inexpensive tablets. And the tablet um, doesn't run on a Linux operating system. It runs on an Android operating system. And if you know computers, you know they're the same thing. Android actually is Linux. But that's how it looks like. It's got a, um, uh, It's almost indestructible. 
it's got a camera all the great things that we um, we use our phones for uh, and frankly many children in the world have phones already so this either it augments their phone use or replaces the phone use or uh, who knows I don't know a lot about this tablet to be honest I don't know how it's being uh, received well or not but I do know it's the next step in the EXO revolution um, this shows us the specifications of the EXO tablet you can look at that on your own time moving on let's talk a bit about Kiva so in class we talked about microfinance very very briefly but I'll remind you what microfinance is microfinance is uh, thought to be the great salvation for the world it wasn't Muhammad Yunus uh, Bangladeshi won the Nobel Prize for his microfinance innovations um, deservedly so and at the time people thought this will revolutionize the world and make poverty a thing of the past microfinance is the idea that we give a little bit of money to entrepreneurs in low-income settings and that and we don't give it to them we loan it to them so we are financing their endeavors at a very small level like ten dollars not a lot of money and we tend to give it to women because women stay in their communities they don't go off and engage in, in risky ventures so an example would be maybe a group of five women in a village need some money to buy some thread to make a business sewing clothing if we give them that money they can invest in the thread and they can make a sustainable business for themselves and their families such that they will not be a burden on the state and they can maintain some degree of manageable wealth for the duration of their lives and possibly transgenerational for a ten dollar investment that's a great great return on investment so that's what we're seeing with with microfinance um, but it's a dark side of microfinance which we'll get to in a second Kiva is the world's biggest microfinance website and it's great I'm a big supporter of Kiva I, I give them money it's great so uh, you can join up right now if you wanted to so you go to kiva.org you create an account and you just pick a company to invest in so uh, first world people that's us we sign up as investors the low-income uh, entrepreneurs sign up as borrowers and if you go on the site you will see a whole host of different kinds of companies in action and I say company very loosely it could be a real company like uh, an auto parts manufacturer or it could be a consortium of, of women sewing uh, uh, mending socks right so we as our investors lend small amounts of money five dollars ten dollars etc and after a while the borrow repays the loan okay so here's how it works here's the first world happy little couple from I don't know Anaheim California gives money to this little company here that gives this woman a little bit of money in order to run her business after a while she makes back her money and gives back the loan to a lovely couple who didn't reinvest it and so forth yeah. here's an example of one of the, the companies looking for investment this is a a group of women in Uganda and they're looking for a total of two hundred and forty three dollars uh, to do what uh, it's unclear what the business is here but um, so uh, even though they want two hundred and forty dollars per per individual in their consortium so the twenty people there they've got at this point uh, almost two thousand dollars uh, raise and they need another three thousand dollars to go and you can lend 25 bucks if you want to this is several years ago so don't go looking for them I'm sure they're they're gone by now that's the kind of idea so microfinance good idea right it changed the world for a lot of people but it had a dark side um, here are some of the criticisms first is that we are privatizing the public safety net why is it the job of uh, you and I to donate 10 bucks each to get these businesses off their feet should not that be the government's job the governments of these countries can afford 10 20 dollars here and there how come they're not doing it that's one of the arguments second is that maybe these businesses become dependent on our loans on our uh, regular in, in injections of cash rather than on investing themselves to produce the capital that they need as would a business here do and lastly 
Um, a lot of the microfinance endeavors focus on women, as I mentioned, because you know, in general women tend to be family-oriented, community-oriented, and there's safer uh, risks for our money. But sometimes they are used as fronts for either men or their in-laws or whatever. Right? They actually don't want the loan, they're being forced to accept the loan for reasons that they're being unclear about. And as a result, we have things like this uh, suicide, microfinance suicide epidemic that affects India. So all these women are massively in debt because they are being uh, put forward by their families to keep on uh, uh, borrowing more and more money and they can't handle the debt and so they kill themselves instead. So financial suicide, uh, suicide as a result of financial misadventure is a really big problem in some parts of the world, especially South Asia. So back to the digital divide in general. There's some other aspects to the digital divide that we need to think about. First is uh, social networking. Uh, it's not just about getting news or getting access to markets or uh, getting an email uh, address or finding a job or being able to take a course online. It's also having the ability to join Facebook or Twitter or whatever platform is big in that country to engage with other people. Organizing is a really powerful tool to have in your society. Open access publishing is something um, perhaps I should give more time to in the future of this course, but um, as I mentioned when I said I gave that talk to those private physicians in South America, they complained that they could not pay for the papers that they found to do their research. Because if you're not aware of this, uh, you're at the university now, your tuition has funded the university library to pay for journal subscriptions on your behalf. Otherwise, each paper you want to read would cost you like 20 bucks, 12 to 20 bucks. And imagine you're writing an article that requires 50 citations. Suddenly, you're spending a thousand bucks just on getting the papers you need. Open access publishing flips that. Open access publishing means anyone can read it for free. So uh, the publisher doesn't get their money from the reader, it gets it from the author. So uh, a lot of your, your professors, myself included, when, when we publish papers, um, we often opt for an open access option. I always do too, so I use my grant money to pay the publisher once they've accepted the paper so that you don't have to pay for it to read it. I think it's more ethical because it means that you as a taxpayer don't have to pay twice to read about the results of the science you've already funded. So open access publishing is an important consideration as internet technology spreads out throughout the world. Is open access going with it? Copyright laws. That's very much related to open access. So um, uh, accessing content online sometimes is gated by the content owner's desire for remuneration. Okay, So some countries don't recognize copyright laws and others are quite st uh, strong about it. So uh, textbooks, for example, are copyrighted. Can you get them online if you haven't paid for it? You don't want to pay the enormous first world fees if you are a poor third world person. Well, I said third world. I, I said I wasn't going to say third world. Low income country person. That's better. Distance education, I mentioned very, very briefly, kind of like distance remote medicine, we can use the internet to learn at a distance. Uh, I've done a lot of work in this area already. One of our first projects was trying to determine if we could teach clinical trials management to remote learners. And we uh, signed up some learners in uh, the outback of Australia, in the Arctic, um, and we gave them a course online. It was it's very, very difficult. This is back uh, 25 years ago when the technology was not nearly as advanced. Well, today, the technology is much, much better. So there's a lot of um, uh, real-time video conferencing for distance education, and it really is making a difference. So I recently did a uh, bit of work with the World Bank to develop strategies for using ICT. ICT stands for Information Communication Technology for Improving the educational infrastructure for several countries in Africa. And my piece of that was to look at whether or not ICT can be used to elevate the status of teachers because they weren't feeling 
or perceived to be well respected in their communities and that was affecting their effectiveness as, uh, as educators. So distance education, an important consideration, uh, an important outcome or avenue for affecting change via information technology. And this last thing, the singularity. What is that? Different people have different takes on the singularity. Um, some people say that's the moment when uh, machines become self-aware. Uh, other people say it's when we become so incredibly bonded to our machines that uh, we can't do without them. Whatever. One interpretation of a singularity is it's the point at which technology has evolved such that we cannot discuss our lives without its context. Here's an example. Imagine you are speaking to a caveman from 40,000 years ago and describing your day, right? You got in your car, you drove to the university, you attended a lecture on epidemiology, you emailed your, your girlfriend, then you went home and microwaved a slice of pizza and went to bed. None of that sentence, none of it would make any sense to that caveman. Where do you even begin to describe what you need to explain in order for them to get a, a, a semblance of what you just talked about. Car, what is that? University, what is that? Class, what is that? Epidemiology, lecture, microwave, pizza, girlfriend, email. None of that matters or has any meaning to a caveman from 40,000 years ago because their lived experience is so profoundly different from yours there is no common ground for understanding or for communicating. So with the singularity, or at least one interpretation of the singularity, it's possible that one half of humanity, the wired technological half, reaches a point where it cannot communicate in an effective manner with the other half of humanity because their technological existences are so divided now that there is no common ground, no context, no frame of reference shared to have a meaningful conversation. That's the fear of a digital divide beyond simply lack of, of, of access to information and opportunity, it may actually be a divide of lived experience so profound it creates a division within the species. I don't think we're there. I don't think we're getting there. I think um, that low-income countries are becoming wired so fast that in many ways they're going to surpass us in many of this. So, in much of this rather. So uh, I'll stop there. Clearly I'm falling asleep. I can't keep my eyes open. And I think uh, we've covered a lot of stuff. So why? Uh, there it is, my friends. I uh, hope this made some sense. Bye-bye.